A tecnologia e a inovação são as forças que nos movimentam. Essa energia leva a conexão de qualidade com preços acessíveis aos locais mais distantes do país, promove a inclusão digital e acelera o desenvolvimento econômico-social dos brasileiros. Muito além da nossa rede de fibra ótica, reforçada pelo satélite geoestacionário e pelo cabo submarino Brasil-Europa, a rede que mais nos motiva é a de pessoas unidas e felizes. Telebras. Tecnologia que une pessoas. Oi pessoal, tudo bem? Yeah. Well, hello everyone. Um, thank you for letting me do this presentation in English. Uh, I was I'm originally from San Francisco, uh, but I've been living in Madrid, Spain, for the past year and a half. And the Spanish were always very quick to point out. They would say, "Mark, uh, if you speak two languages, you're bilingual. If you speak three languages, you're trilingual. If you speak one language, you're American." So I'm always very sensitive to say thank you for allowing me to speak in English. Uh, I think we're going to have fun for the next 40 or so minutes. We're really going to do a few things. One is we're going to talk about innovation in general, just giving you some concepts. Two, talk about how that's being applied in some real world examples and how human-centered design is, techniques are being used to create new digital products. So if it's OK, what we'll do is we'll just go ahead and jump in. So this is a nice shot of our beautiful city of San Francisco, where Visa is headquartered. We're the world's largest payments and commerce network. We operate in over 200 different countries. But we have the benefit of being based in the heart of Silicon Valley. So we have this front row view into what's happening in the world of digital innovation and transformation. But let's take a step back. I always like to talk about this. Charles Darwin, this whole notion of evolution, said this famous thing. He said, it's not the strongest or the, the smartest that survives. It's the species that's most adaptable to change. Right? And we see that time and time and again, not only in the, the physical world of, of species, but also in companies. Right? It doesn't matter if you have a big balance sheet. It doesn't matter if you have a bunch of McKinsey consultants running your company. The truth is the companies that will win over time are the ones who can adapt to changing marketplaces and adapting to consumer trends. So let's take this another step. So then let's go to economics. So everyone knows Keynes and economics. But one of the most famous economists of his day was Joseph Schumpeter. And Joseph was uh, Austrian. And he created the entire field of what's called evolutionary economics. And I love this quote where he says, capitalism can only be understood as an evolutionary process of continuous innovation driven by the perennial gale of creative destruction. So that's actually what we've seen happen in our marketplaces. And by the way, I love this picture of, uh, of our friend Joseph. Uh, if you go on Wikipedia, you can read about his history. And Joseph uh, was Austrian, and he, he was full of bravado. And he said, on, he's, he proudly proclaimed, in my life, I'm going to be three things. One is I'm going to be the greatest economist in the history of the world. 
Number two is I'm going to be the greatest equestrian uh, in the country of Austria. And three, I'm going to be the greatest lover in the city of Vienna. And if you read on Wikipedia, it's hilarious. On his deathbed, he laments that he only, uh, he only achieved two of his three goals because there were too many great equestrians in Austria. So that's our friend Joseph. So if we actually look at the metrics, let's look at the facts around this. What does that mean? So if you look at the Fortune 500, the 500 largest companies in the world, that list was created in 1955. And if you asked of, the, of those companies, how long have they been in existence, the answer in 1955 was, on average, 90 or so years. Fast forward to today, and the answer is less than 20. Of the original list, less than 15% of those companies exist today. So in basically half a century, 85% of those companies have gone away. Over 2,000 different companies have been on that list. Who's on the list today? Let's look. So I just pulled together this list. This was as of January 26th, so two days ago. All right, you have Apple was only founded in 1976 with the world's largest market cap of 554 billion. Their last quarter, they just announced they made $18 billion of profit, the largest profit in a quarter ever recorded in the history of any company, right? They only, they exist, I was alive when they started, right? Um, Google was only founded in 1998. I don't know how I would function without Google Maps today. Everyone here uses a Google product in one shape or form, and yet, like, that means they're 17 years old. In the United States, you, can, you are eligible to get a driver's license to drive a car at age 16. So if Google were a company, they just were able to get a driver's license last year, right? And yet they have a market cap of almost a half trillion dollars. You go through this list, and it's pretty amazing to see what's happening. Also in Silicon Valley, here's an overlay. Today, the most successful, arguably, the most successful venture capital firm in Silicon Valley is Andreessen Horowitz. That's Mark Andreessen on the left. He was, wrote the first web browser, Mosaic. And Ben Horowitz, who is one of the most celebrated entrepreneurs and now venture capitalists. And a few years ago, he wrote this blog called Software is Eating the World. And if you look at what's happening, that's exactly what's happening here today. And you go around, people are writing software, and they're recreating industries and reimagining the way that value is transacted. So let's take a look. This is perhaps a little overdone, but I, I think it's shocking if you take a step back and look at this, right? The, the iPhone is nine years old, and the App Store, which is really the thing that powers the whole ecosystem, is only eight years old. So if you pulled out an iPhone and you said, hey, let's just look at the, the home screen and see if these guys are right, the software is eating the world. Well, let's take a look. Is there anyone here who wants to be in the manufacturing of, of cameras business? No, right? <laughs> How about maps? Rand McNally was the largest map maker, maker in the world. Like bankrupt, they're gone. No one needs it. How about a promising career as a travel agent? Right? No way. Keep going. How about the weather? Right? I remember when I was a kid, my mom would say, stop dinner. We have to go watch the weather for tomorrow, right? It doesn't happen anymore. You have it on demand 24 hours a day for wherever you happen to be standing. Borders was one of the largest book and music stores in the United States. Bankrupt, gone. And then Tower Records, this was their, their iconic store in San Francisco. I used to go there all the time. Bankrupt, gone, right? So in, and it's all powered by the App Store in this case, right? So all you're doing is just looking at the home screen of this little device in your hand, and yet you see that there's a half dozen industries that are gone now in the span of less than a decade. So it's really amazing what's happening. So how, how, how is this happening? So let's do a couple of fun applied examples. Uh, this is definitely happening in our world at Visa with payments, right? There are all sorts of Apple Pay, Samsung Pay, Android Pay, all the different things that are happening. Uh, here in Brazil, Nubank is a great story, right? So even big traditional industries like banking are now that we thought were protected because of regulations and lots of other things are starting to be attacked by these new entrants. So here's this burning platform. Has anyone been to Burning Man? All the engineers in San Francisco, like there's a week during the year when the city clears out and they all go out to the desert and light some stuff on fire. Yeah, so that's what that picture is. 
So we, every industry has this burning platform to reinvent itself using digital capabilities. But I want to take a step back and talk about human-centered design. Human-centered design is one of the key elements that is winning in the marketplace. Companies that use this technique, which is not rocket science, are winning in the marketplace. It was sort of created jointly between the consulting firm IDEO and Stanford's, technically the name is the Hasso Plattner Institute for Design. Uh, it's known as the D School. So if you go to Stanford today, which is just down the road from Visa, um, you'll find that all of the MBA students are, are taking all their extra classes at the D School because this is where the energy is being created. Right? And it's literally just a five-step process that starts with empathy and it moves all the way through to prototyping just to make sure that you're focused on solving something that your customer really wants solved. Right? So I wanna, this is the example that if you went to Stanford that they would use. So in this picture is an industrial engineer. His name is Doug Dietz. Uh, and Doug is a, an award-winning industrial designer for GE Healthcare. And he designs these MRI machines, so the things that can scan your body. He also is a professor at the D School uh, part-time. So when I was there, Doug was one of my professors, and he tells this story that he designed these great machines for GE. And so as one of the techniques you learn in design thinking, you have to go into the field and you learn how do your customers use the things you've designed. So Doug decides he's gonna go to some hospitals and he talks to doctors, and he talks to x-ray technicians, and he says, what do you think of my MRI machines? And they all say, they're awesome. They're really fast, the images are really clear, I can diagnose what's going on. They're a little expensive, but you know, Doug, you design the best things. So Doug feels great about this. He's like, wow, I'm really designing good stuff. And by the way, he holds lots of patents. He's won design awards. But in design thinking, they have you ask the question, like, who is your end customer? And so Doug tells the story, and it's a really powerful story, that it, he was walking out of a doctor's office because of patient privacy laws. And in, as he was leaving, the next patient was coming in. And it was a mother and her eight-year-old daughter. And the daughter was bald because she had cancer and she was going through chemotherapy. And she was screaming as she was walking down the hall. Her mother was dragging her down the hall saying, mommy, no, I don't want to go in there. It's scary. And Doug tells the story, he said, and I was shocked. It dawned on me that I was actually completely failing in what I was building, what I was trying to do. And he shows the picture up on the top right. And he said, I looked at my machine and through the eyes of a child, what is this? It's a human stapler. You're asking a child to go into this cold environment and be a human staple. Like, like, so he's like, this is really scary. I have to redesign it. So using the techniques of design thinking, of empathy, solving, identifying the problem, ideating ways you can solve the problem, prototyping that, and then testing it, he, he ended up using a technique where he went to a children's museum and said, how could I do something that engages children in a way that they'll actually like this? So here's what they came up with. Wow. So by the way, all these are are stickers. They just put stickers on the machines. And before the child comes in, they, ask, they tell the children a story. And they say, hey, guess what? You're going to go into this magical world, and you have to be perfectly still while they're doing an MRI. If you don't move, there are magic fish, and they're going to jump around you. But if you start moving, they'll stop, which is true. Um, and lo and behold, the children love this thing. In the old world, without the stickers, 95% of the children had to be sedated, literally put to sleep, which is not only very expensive, but it's also medically risky. After doing this, when you tell the children you're going to the magical world and the fish are going to jump around you, guess what? Sedation rate is 5%. Everyone wins, right? Very simple techniques, and it becomes a completely different experience. So that's design thinking. So let's move forward to the next concept. And this is, okay, so if you're gonna, there's this new digital world, you're gonna use design thinking as a way to make sure you're solving a customer problem, then how do you do it? And this is something big companies in particular screw up all the time, because they have the resources to do stuff at scale. But the winning model is completely the opposite. It's like doing things really small, really fast, and learning. So it's about speed and iteration. Think big, 
but start small, and when you get the right thing, scale fast. So I want to share with you an example that I lived through uh, when I was working with McDonald's in their innovation lab. So this was in the early 2000s, so you have to t assume this is a decade ago. Um, I don't know if you know these two people, maybe not by, by their face, but the, the guy at the top is Sergio Zyman. He was the longtime chief marketing officer of Coca-Cola who built one of the world's most valuable brands. So we had him as a consultant helping us. And then the other guy is Gary Hamill, uh, along with Michael Porter, probably the most well-known uh, corporate strategy, innovation strategist in the world. He's a professor at Harvard and INSEAD. So he, he has a firm called Stratagos. who so are working with Stratagos on how could we reinvent McDonald's business. And there I am when I still had hair. Um, and w they use this technique called the double diamond uh, process where you ideate, converge, ideate, converge. You've probably seen it. Uh, and they have this concept around what are your core competencies as a company? How do you challenge beliefs that exist in the system? And look at consumer trends. So when we went through this methodology with a team and rigorous work over a period of months, here's what we said at McDonald's. We said McDonald's is actually kind of only good at a few things. One, getting really good real estate where there's lots of traffic. Number two, we have a, there's a great supply chain that feeds those restaurants. Has anyone ever been to McDonald's and they go, sorry, no fries today, we're out. No, it doesn't happen. I don't know why, but like they're amazing at making sure that their supply chain is great. Third, at the time, as we said, there's this consumer trend of automation technologies and people, you can pay at the gas pump. You don't have to have a person anymore, so you just swipe your card and you go. And the fourth one, and this is a fascinating one, was we recognized that time was becoming more important than money in many ways. So when I was growing up, my mother would drive miles out of her way to go to the grocery store that had bread and milk that was cheaper. But today, most consumers would probably pay an extra five cents a gallon to save themselves not having to drive five miles, right? Time is becoming really valuable. So we put all this together. And we said, what could we do at McDonald's that would be new and different? And here's what our idea. The idea was to take a convenience store, so a corner store that had all your staples that you could walk into and reinvent that, take people out of it, and just make it, if you look at the right, it was literally a 20 feet by 10 feet refrigerated box. We called this then Red Box. And we put it outside of Metro stops in Washington, DC. And on the left, you'll see some of the different items that were in there. And our belief was that we were going to disrupt this whole corner store convenience industry, taking people out. Someone would come out of the Metro, swipe their card, take their milk, their bread, and they would go. It was going to be a huge win. And so this, was a, a, this is a quote that I had in the Washington Post where I said, the red box will do for the convenience store industry what ATMs did for the banking industry. So I, I was, that was my Joseph Schumpeter moment. I was full of bravado. <clears throat> well, uh, by the way, if anyone's been to Washington, D.C., we did three of these. Uh, this one happened to be in the Adams Morgan neighborhood, which is literally right behind Capitol Hill in the big Capitol building. But guess what? Had we scaled this thing, it would have failed. For whatever reason, People were not interested in coming out of the metro and getting their milk and their bread. They just weren't. And so this was, luckily I wasn't quoted, about a year later when the New York Times wrote an article that was not very flattering that said, McDonald said it's going to close its four giant vending machines in the Washington area after some experiments. And if you read through the article, near the end there was a little statement that said, but it will continue to operate the 12 units that do just DVDs. So actually I'm going to go back. Do you see the red thing in there? We were testing different things to see what people would buy. One of the things we just threw in there was literally a DVD. And we said, it's a dollar a day, and if you want to rent it, great. Return it after three days, it's three bucks. I don't know why. People didn't buy milk. They didn't buy diapers. They didn't buy bread. They didn't buy orange juice. But they were buying, renting DVDs like crazy. So it is true that we closed down the three or four that we had built that were these monstrous refrigerated things, but instead, what happened? And if you've been to the United States, you'll know that Redbox is the second largest distributor of media in the country, right? You can sort of read through the statistics. 30,000 locations, almost the entire population lives within a driving distance to one of these machines. Uh, McDonald's ended up selling it to a, a publicly traded company called Coinstar, 
uh, for a $200 million profit. And in 2015, Coinstar, if you read their public filings, said that Redbox produced a half, $500 million of profits for their company. So the point is, we could have scaled, we did all this analysis, all the smart people in the room, and we could have scaled those big boxes and it would have failed. But instead, we just put it out and said really quickly, what will work, what will not work, and we scaled the thing that did work. So think big, start small, scale fast. Let me use one other example. This is another example of speed and agility, and I show these two pizzas because one of the concepts that, that kind of goes hand in hand with this lean startup, think big, start small, is if, you have, if your team, if you, can't, if you cannot feed your team with two pizzas, your team is too big. No more than could feed two pizzas. So keep your team small. So this was some work I did with a, a, a US bank, and they had this large loyalty program tied to a credit card. But they had this problem, which is people were building up these rewards, and large segments of them never used them. And so the whole point of a loyalty problem, a program is you want people to use your program so they use your card more, they don't end up switching to different cards. So we said, let's solve it. And so all we did was we put an ad on Craigslist and said, hey, if you have one of these cards, come talk to us. We brought in about 10 different people, and here's what they said. Well, I, I think it's a really great program, but it's really, it's kind of a hassle. I have to remember to go to a website. I have to remember how to log in, which I've probably forgotten. Then I, I choose something, and then it takes two weeks to fulfill, and it's just sort of a hassle. And oh, by the way, I'm going to save up for something really big. I don't know if any of you feel this. With my reward program, I'm going to save up all my points because I'm going to take this incredible vacation to Disney World in three years, and I'm going to take my whole family. Right? But the truth is people don't actually do that. And so we said, hmm. How could we solve that so that this rewards program isn't something way out in the future, but it's something that they could experience every day? So we said, what if you could just use your points to buy stuff every day, like coffee and snacks and pizza? Apparently, I'm obsessed with pizza. Um, and when we asked people, would you use your points for that if you could do it? Everyone goes, oh, yeah, there should be an app for that. I would totally do that. So OK, using our two pizza team, we just drew up some mock together some things of what that would look like. And we showed it to some customers. And you know what they said? Like, that is great. I would use that. Why don't you build it? I would do it. And here's one of the insights. When you just draw something on a piece of paper, it's clear that you have not invested a lot of time into this thing. And because of that, it breaks through this fundamental thing in human nature that people want to tell you, or they, they will tell you what they think you want to hear. And so if, you did, if we showed them a real app, they would have been, oh, it looks great. Yeah, I would use that. By the way, at McDonald's, we did that all the time. We'd ask focus groups, hey, if we put a veggie burger on the menu, would you eat it? Oh, yeah. You know, and you put it on the menu, no one got it. Right? <laughs> Same thing here. By using a very low-resolution low technique, you'll actually get real answers. So based on this feedback, using our two pizza team, we built a really simple app. And by the way, I love this thing. We only used it with 100 employees. So we're, we, uh, here's the idea. If you look at the left, we integrated a Google map. You'd open up your app, and there's a, a blue dot that says, here's where you're standing. All these other dots around you, it's a retailer where you could go in and buy whatever you want using your points. So you can see at the top, it showed your point value, in this case, 7,825 points. And let's say you walked into a Starbucks. And so you bought a thing for $6.54. You would enter $6.54, hit pay with points, which is the middle screen. And all we did was use a third-party API, and we were on the back end buying a digital gift card. And that gift card was for $6.54. Now, the consumer didn't know, know that. All they knew is that they would say pay with points. Over the air, it generated the barcode. Then you show the barcode to the barista. They scan it. Done. You walk out with your coffee, and it's $6.54 worth of points you just used. Awesome, right? I thought so. Um, guess what? We found out that it was not so awesome. Here's what we found. That indeed, here's the great news. We had a hypothesis that people would use it for everyday stuff. And this is what they used it for. They used it for Starbucks. They used it for CVS, which is a big convenience store. Um, super. But here's what else we found. Guess what? When you're in a line at Starbucks, 
and that Starbucks is in a bad location and it doesn't have very good wireless coverage, and there are 20 people behind you shaking because they want their caffeine, and you're telling the barista, well, I, I, wait a minute, I have to, the barcode has to generate and it's not up yet. Like, that's a bad experience, right? Or I had the experience when I went to a CVS and said, I want to pay with this. Like, oh, no, we don't take points. Now, I happen to know, oh, but do you take gift cards? Oh, yeah, we take that. Yeah, that's what this is. Scan it. And it worked. But lots of customers said they had this problem where it wasn't accepted. So we're like, okay, we know that fundamentally people will use their points to buy everyday stuff, but there's some other stuff we really have to fix. A few weeks later, two pizza team changes it. We went to a gift card metaphor that said, great, you can load it in advance, use your points to put $20 on, your, on a Starbucks gift card. Right? So then when you show it, everyone knows exactly what it is. There's no lag time. The barcode doesn't have to be generated. It's already there. Oh, by the way, look in the middle one. <clears throat> no one knew what a point was worth. So we did the conversion to show, here's what your purchasing power is. In this case, $168.48, right? And that was it. And that ended up, in the course of six weeks, being able to show, you know, this, to take a problem, a human-centered problem, have a hypothesis about what it was, do a couple of pivots, and now you have the insight into the things that will really work. This was actually the picture of the entire team to see how big or small it was. Uh, the, the picture on the top right is a, was the first time we'd actually worked in a Starbucks. We like that. So those are two really good examples. Here's the third one, the third principle. So human-centered design is winning. Second one, think big, start small, scale fast. And the third one, this is a little bit back to and Andreessen Horowitz. They also penned this thing about uh, a full-stack startup. And when they say stack, it doesn't mean technology, right? We all are used to talking about the tech stack. They're saying think about the entire value proposition of an industry and use software to reinvent that stack. And so you may have seen this. This is, was last spring, one of the folks at Habas Media Insights wrote this blog and they said, something has changed, right? When Uber uh, is the world's largest taxi company and yet they don't own a single car. Facebook is the world's largest media company, which by the way had an awesome quarter you may have seen yesterday. Um, but they actually don't create any of their own content. Alibaba, the world's largest retailer, doesn't actually have any inventory. Alibaba did a billion dollars of e-commerce sales in a single day recently. Like, it's amazing what they're doing. And then Airbnb, which we, we've all read about and I assume many people have used, right? They're the largest accommodation provider and yet they don't own a single hotel room. So like, it's a completely different world. So this whole notion of you now have the freedom because of the tools and technology that's available to completely reimagine industries. And when I look around this room, I, I think that's what people are doing. So um, that's sort of the, the arc of the story. And what I wanted to show you was how we think about it. We have a very short video. We have innovation centers at Visa in San Francisco. Uh, in Miami, we're building one here in Sao Paulo, uh, Dubai, Singapore, to do exactly this sort of work. So if it's okay, why don't we, sh why don't we roll the video? Where we sit today, and at least I think about the future of, of payments and where Visa sits, is we're just hitting our stride. With the advent of electronic commerce in the late 90s, and now more importantly with 7 billion mobile devices all connected to the internet, uh, the future of payments is unfolding around us. And so for us, uh, and what we're doing at One Market Center is effectively helping them understand how these things come together, demystify some of the technology, and certainly help them see the future, at least certainly as we see it. At our core, it's always been about collaboration. And now as we sit here today and think about the future, though, it's how we bring in digital partners, the likes of Apple, Google, Samsung, uh, telcos from around the world to help create those new digital uh, means from which consumers and merchants can interact. Our vision for One Market Center is made up of three parts. The first part is engage, the second is experience, and the third is collaborate. What we do in the innovation team in the collaboration and co-creation is we have small groups of folks that put together working prototypes in very short cycle times. Five to six weeks we will build a prototype that is working. It may not all be fully functional, but it'll be working and it will show what the art of the possible is. It's really brought to life what you can do. By the time somebody might have written a business case with PowerPoint and Excel, we'd like to have the prototype finished. So we're just really happy about this new way of engaging with clients, which is not about selling them stuff. Uh, it's really about becoming a strategic partner. 
we, we'd like to try things out and we'd like to see what works. And if it works, great, we'll leave it. And if it doesn't, we move it around. The future of commerce is today. Great. So I think you kind of saw the arc of the story there, right? So if you, if you uh, have the resource of a big company, that's great. You can build a beautiful space. But you probably saw a picture of the car. Like they literally went out and they bought a car from a junkyard and stuck it in the middle of a lab and said, we're going to figure out a car of the future is going to be smart. And when you drive across a bridge and you pay a toll, and when you go through a drive through to buy some food, or if you pay for parking, or when your insurance is due at the end of the month, all of that can be tied to a biometric and it could be perhaps put out on the blockchain. So it, it's an excuse to think big, start small, and prototype all this stuff and learn what works and what doesn't work. So, arc the story. Human-centered design is winning in the marketplace. Two, think big, but don't be big. Be small and nimble. And then third, use all of those capabilities to completely reimagine and create your own full-stack startup of your industry. I hope this has been helpful. Obrigado y brazos. Um, and I'm open for some questions. I'm around for a little bit. I don't know if we do that now or separately. Thank you. I'm not sure. Is there a mic? Hand mic, maybe? There we go. Hi, Mark. Uh, thank you for your keynote. It was very enlightening. Good. Uh, can you uh, share with us some lessons learned on having this uh, new way of thinking uh, applying inside Visa? I'm not sure how, how is the culture in Visa, but we are more used to uh, uh, having this uh, project specification and budget. Yeah, yep, yep. And how do you convince the yeah. white hair guys in the room That's that, right. hey, we need to iterate. I don't know what are we going to reach at the end, but let's do it. That's right. Uh, it's a great question. So companies, uh, Jack Welch, you know, the famous uh, CEO of GE, in his last shareholder letter uh, talked about why is the companies seem to lose their way and they don't, they're not focused on the customer. And what he said was, it's not that companies don't like their customers, it's that they just find themselves so much more interesting to talk about. <laughs> right? And so here's what I find. The people that are senior levels of big companies are incredibly smart. And they got there because they have critical thinking skills. And so there's an idea of something. And they're really good at finding ways that it won't work. And so I, my experience is the way you cut through that is with facts. So um, I'll, I'll give you a McDonald's example. Uh, one of the other projects we did there was, we, this was in the early 2000s, was we started to roll out Wi-Fi. And at the time, Wi-Fi was not very common. It was the 802.11b standard. And Starbucks had a paid subscription service. You would have to go there, and it was like this big deal. And we said, why don't we just make it free to bring people in the restaurants? And we presented it to the executive committee. And I'll never forget one of the most senior guys called me lots of bad names and said, if we did that, I can tell you what's going to happen. So there's going to be a family having a happy meal in the McDonald's, and some guy in a trench coat is going to come in, and he's going to be surfing porn. And then the New York Times is going to do a cover article that McDonald's is enabling you know, bad guys to you know, do bad stuff in our restaurants, right? But instead, we said, well, I, that may be true. I mean, it may not be. Why don't we just take three locations, let's put Wi-Fi in, and see what happens? And so that's what we did. We went to New York. We actually did it in Times Square and a couple of other places. By the way, never, no bad stuff happened. Lots of good stuff happened. So we expanded it to three cities. We ran it in New York, Chicago, and Seattle. Lots of good stuff happened. Today, you go to almost any McDonald's in the world, and they have free Wi-Fi. And it actually is the largest retail Wi-Fi deployment in the world. Right? So I think the answer to all of these is, look, wait, we can do all the analysis. There are all these things that could be wrong. Let's just do a small pilot. Let's run it for a week. Let's run it for a month. Let's do it with 10 customers, with 100 customers, and scale it. Because then you have the facts to go, by the way, this thing is a winner. right? We, we started with 100. We were wrong. We did it for 1,000. 1,000 loved it. Here's what wins. Great business. You take it. You scale it. Any other questions?
Uh, hello. I think the, the most difficult part is the validation methods. Uh, in Visa, what do you use to validate the idea, how you can see and realize that DVD uh, sell more than other things? How you apply and have this, oh, that's the direction I need to go? Yeah. I, I think there's a couple of pieces to the, that puzzle. And the, com the companies that do it right take an approach. They say, here are the two or three themes where we know there's a bunch of really interesting stuff happening. So let's take it at Visa. We could say, a few years ago, you go, look, QR codes are coming out. NFC has been talked about a bunch. There's these cloud-based wallets. There's all these, there's Bitcoin, all these alternative cryptocurrencies. Like, we don't know, like, but we know there's something in the, this emerging payment space. So let's do a bunch of prototyping, or let's do a kick the tires there. Um, so one, I think it's the first piece is have your themes pretty rigor rigorously defined. And then the second thing is then have a hypothesis around each of those themes and then test those. So uh, if you remember in, well, it's like you're a scientist, right? They have the little Petri dishes and they put in the agar jelly and they put in different things to see which ones grow, right? I think that's the methodology you end up using. You say, we're going to have four or five different examples of how the world might look, and each one is its own Petri dish, and let's run tests with real consumers in markets to find out what works so we have the facts and the data so that as the market moves forward, what ultimately always happens is because there's a migration path, you're here today, the world's gonna be here tomorrow, that's your hypothesis, so you do some tests here, and what you find is because you're here, you're able to see where the endpoint is sooner than others that are still back here. And so you throw out three of the four Petri dishes, and then you bet on the one that you know is going to win. I'll come over here. You guys um, recently bought a company called um, TrioPay. Yes. How do you think that the future of payments related to data or uh, people generated data? Um, that's a really profound question, longer than I'll probably be able to answer, but the, the net is, look, there's a proliferation of data in the world. You can use it for lots of good things. Uh, in the world of payments, I think the, the insight is that there's not a real consumer pain point on buying something. You can swipe a card, you can tap a card, but if you think about the customer journey through customers' eyes, like there's a whole set of decisions that are pre-purchase that involves offers and deals and how you want to spend your money and budgeting. There's the transaction itself, and then there's a whole set of activities after the transaction around receipts or uh, servicing or follow-up. And so if you think through that, all of that's going to be powered by customer-centric data. By the way, a lot of that will be stuff like geolocation. Right? Uh, people have talked about geolocated offers for a long time. I've never seen it work in a market in a real way. Someone's going to figure it out. I think Trial Pay, by the way, has a really nice shot. They're a great company. So you're going to see p the smart companies are going to use all different forms of data to create an entirely new customer experiences. One more over there. Then we probably need to wrap it up. Okay. Hello. Um, I have a doubt, which is, what's the difference between design thinking and UX? It, that's what I'd like to know, the difference between design thinking and UX. Oh, and user ex UX, user like experience. design? Yeah. Uh, you know what, they are like, brother and sister, they go together. Uh, matter of fact, most human-centered design or design thinking teams are the front end of a UX team, oh. right? Okay, okay. And it's very common to have the integrated team be a design thinker and someone who's UX and then a product person and an engineer, like that's your team. Oh, okay, yep. oh my God. thank you. So your intuition is spot on. Great. Well, I'm happy to wrap this up. I hope you found this helpful. Uh, Visa's really excited to be part of what's going on here. I have to tell you, coming from San Francisco, I am shocked 
and excited and like full of energy when I see what's going on here. You should be really proud of the ecosystem that's being developed here in, in Brazil. Thank you.